Strange things happening worldwide. Underground bunkers. Does the Bible mention current events, such as bunkers? Explaining this subject involves addressing three complex puzzles. Let's break them down into simpler terms and discuss how they relate. Puzzle 1. The Prophecy. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people, and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong, and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The bunkers appear in Revelation 6. And Revelation chapter 6 through 16 covers Satan on earth. This particular segment of the book is the crux, the very heart of the matter, and can be quite challenging to comprehend. Unfortunately, we have now reached the most unpleasant part of the book, the worst judgments. The situation will deteriorate significantly before any improvement can be seen. The scenario depicted in the upcoming chapters is grim. However, it is reassuring to know that the scenario depicted in the book is the worst it can be. The reader can take solace in the fact that things will only get better from here on out. Nevertheless, the upcoming chapters are distressing enough to make one feel uneasy. The bunkers are mentioned as part of prophecy yet to be fulfilled, as they are part of the seven seals. At the time being referred to, no amount of authority, grandeur, riches, valor, or strength would be able to provide support to the people. No bunker or fancy steel cages would feel safe enough. Even those who were considered to have nothing to fear would be filled with a sense of amazement on that day. The situation would be so overwhelming that I would wish for it all to crash. Take a moment to behold the scene before you, and note the extent of the fear and amazement displayed by those present. Their reactions are undoubtedly intense and palpable, a testament to the gravity of the situation. In times of this extreme hardship, their emotional state will become so intense that it may lead them to feel as if they are being pushed to their limits. The weight of their troubles may become so unbearable that they may feel as if they have no other choice but to give up. The situation becomes so dire that people are driven to the point of desperation. They even wish for the mountains to fall upon them and the hills to cover them. They would prefer to disappear completely and cease to exist. Also, observe the cause of their terror, namely, the angry countenance of him that sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. All individuals are equally humbled by the wrath of God. This judgment is especially profound, since it is the wrath of the Lamb. It is the fierce anger of love, the anger of selfless love that has done everything that is possible for our salvation. This anger tells us with absolute certainty that evil will eventually be destroyed by God. They say in their bunkers, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. People don't just hide from the fear of punishment, but also from the very sight of the Almighty who reigns in heaven. The things that terrifies sinners the most is not just the thought of dying, but the intimidating and overwhelming presence of God Himself. The statement emphasizes the inseparable unity between Christ and God. It suggests that anything that causes displeasure to Christ also causes displeasure to God, as they are one and the same. This implies that the will and intention of Christ and God are identical, and they share a single divine purpose. Although God is invisible, he can make the inhabitants of this world aware of his severe displeasure. Although Christ is often depicted as a gentle lamb, it is important to remember that he is capable of anger, even to the point of wrath. The wrath of the lamb is extremely terrifying, as if the very one who saves us from God's wrath becomes our enemy. Then who will plead for us? Those who fall victim to the wrath of the Redeemer will be without hope. Their fate will be sealed with no chance of redemption. This is the very bottom of hopelessness and despair. Throughout history, it has been observed that individuals are presented with opportunities and periods of grace to make amends for their sins. Similarly, God also has His own day of righteous wrath, a day where all sinners will have to face the consequences of their wrongdoings. This day will be so dreadful that even the bravest sinners will not be able to stand before God. The people of Judea and Jerusalem experienced the terror of this day during their destruction, and it will befall all unrepentant sinners on the day of the final judgment. 
The anguish, fear, and despair that will be experienced by sinners on that day will be beyond measure. The Wrath of the Lamb In times of trouble, humans will desperately look for shelter and safety wherever they can find it. It is at such moments that the fleeting and temporary nature of human existence becomes evident. The upheaval in the sky is not just an ordinary occurrence, but a warning of a greater terror to come. It is the expression of God's wrath, a terrifying and awe-inspiring force that is beyond human comprehension. The wrath of the Lamb is an unusual phrase that terrified people used to describe the calamities they experienced. It's worth noting that they do not view the Lamb of God, who gave His life for human sin or God, who sent His Son to die as the cause of these calamities. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through Him. The people of the world still view God as a vengeful being. The wrath of God, of course, is a basic theme of the Bible. Revelation tells us much about it. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp word, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Another term for the day of the Lord is a day of judgment, as described by the prophets Joel and Zephaniah. Joel described it as dreadful, while Zephaniah characterized it as a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. The wrath of God is not a manifestation of vengeful hate or personal vindictiveness. Instead, it is God's holy response to unrepented sin, which is the root cause of the misery and suffering that humans bring upon themselves. During this time of judgment, the people of earth, even kings, ask a legitimate question. Who can stand? The question is a quote from Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? In the book of Isaiah, there is a reference to the rolling up of the heavens, like a scroll, in relationship to the day of the Lord. This is a metaphor for a cosmic judgment where God punishes the wicked nations. The passage also mentions the hosts of heaven withering like a leaf on a fig tree. The passage also indicates that it is ultimately loyalty to Jesus Christ rather than social status ultimately determines one's fate. Ancients often used opposites to categorize people, such as slave and free, but death negates such distinctions. Job chapter 3 verse 19, the small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. In verse 15, John emphasizes that no one, from the highest to the lowest, will be exempt from judgment. Prior verses indicate that in the face of natural disasters, humanity is often spurred to admit something typically suppressed, an admission that God is God and that what is happening is His judgment. The approaching events were tremendous, and several occurrences contributed to making that day and era extremely dreadful. First, it was a great earthquake. Second, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, either naturally by a total eclipse or politically by the fall of the chief rulers and governors of the land. Third, the moon should become as blood. Fourth, the stars of heaven shall fall to the earth. Fifth, the heaven should depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. Sixth, every mountain and island shall be moved out of its place. We read, a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. This will not be something strange. Throughout the Bible, there are numerous references to celestial disturbances that are believed to signify the arrival of the Messiah. These occurrences have been mentioned in the prophetic books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and Zephaniah, as well as by Jesus himself. These disturbances are described in great detail and are believed to hold significant symbolic meaning concerning the arrival of the Messiah. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 16. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming very quickly. Listen to the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. The day is a day of anger, 
a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. We also see something equally disastrous in Joel chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon become dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is indeed very great, for mighty is one who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? Earthquakes were often regarded as a sign of divine intervention throughout the Old Testament. For instance, the entire mountain shook violently during God's descent on Mount Sinai. Similarly, the prophet Isaiah predicted that the Lord would one day shake the earth as a form of punishment. In the book of Haggai, the Lord himself declares that he will soon shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, as a means of demonstrating his power and authority. This is undoubtedly the power of God. In this case, we read, The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. It is best to consider these images as realistic, yet poetic. John's language was not technically precise, but he simply depicted what he observed. What is the biblical understanding of the wrath of God? Wrath refers to the emotional reaction to perceived injustice or wrongdoing. It can be described as anger, vexation, indignation, or irritation. Both humans and God can exhibit wrath, but there is a significant difference between the two. The wrath of God is distinct from the wrath of man. The wrath of God is always wholly and justified, but the wrath of man is rarely justified and never holy. The Old Testament portrays the wrath of God as a divine reaction to human sin and disobedience. Most frequently, idolatry triggers this divine wrath. For instance, Psalm chapter 78 verses 56 through 66 recounts Israel's idolatry. The divine wrath is consistently aimed at those who fail to follow God's will. Psalm chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. Why are the nations restless and the peoples plotting in vain? Kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. He who sits in the heavens laugh. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. The wrath of God against sin and disobedience is completely justified because God's plan for humanity is holy and perfect, just like God himself. God has made a way to receive his divine favor, which is through repentance. By repenting, a sinner can turn God's wrath away from themselves. However, if someone rejects this perfect plan, they reject God's love, mercy, grace, and favor, and will incur his righteous wrath. The New Testament supports the concept of a wrathful God who judges sin. The story of the rich man and Lazarus illustrates the judgment of God and the severe consequences for unrepentant sinners. John chapter 3 verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The one who believes in the Son will not suffer God's wrath for his sin because the Son took God's wrath upon Himself when He died in our place on the cross. Those who do not believe in the Son, who do not receive Him as Savior, will be judged on the day of wrath. Romans chapter 2, verses 5-6 through six. But Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will repay each person according to his deeds. The wrath of God is a fearsome and terrifying thing. Only those who have been covered by the blood of Christ, shed for us on the cross, can be assured that God's wrath will never fall on them. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Man humbled. God exalted. God has amazing ways of making men feel as though they are nothing more than dust. He will sweep entire dynasties away just as people remove an anthill when it has become a nuisance. If you examine the books of history, 
you will discover that the Lord, in all of the works of providence that have been done up until this point, has been continually bringing down haughty looks and making the haughtiness of man to be humbled. Indeed, it appears that this is the miraculous work of God. And if there is a man who were to turn to me and ask, what is God doing? I would respond by saying, he is elevating those who are lowly while he is lowering those who are proud. He always appears to be involved in this as if it were his natural work and he takes pleasure in it. He takes down nests that are built among the stars. What is constantly being done in his providence will continue until the pride of humanity is completely eradicated. There will be no more place in this heaven for any kind of majesty except for the King of Kings. Under the canopy of heaven, there will be only one name before which people shall bow, one throne that will be held in high regard in people's minds, and only one name by which all the families of the earth shall be called. In that day, when all the earth will be filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea, it shall be said, He has demolished the arrogance of man, and the Lord alone is exalted. Our good deeds and merits cannot save them. Instead, we should turn to Christ and contemplate his wounds, which are the source of salvation, mercy, and peace. To be saved, sinners must recognize Christ as their only Savior and honor him, even though he was despised and humiliated during his time on earth. This message humbles humanity and discourages arrogance. Possibly, there is nothing in the gospel that offends some people's pride more than the doctrine that man is a sinner, a spiritually dead sinner, and is saved by the work of another. Unfortunately, many have turned away from him. Jesus was saddened by the fact that people were refusing his grace and mercy and instead choosing to starve themselves of the love and compassion he had to offer. Some individuals have even stopped listening to Jesus because they disagreed with his teachings. It is important to remember that we have the choice to either accept or reject the message of Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we come before you with humble hearts, seeking refuge and protection under your divine wings. We are grateful for your unwavering love and the promises you've bestowed upon us. In the words of Psalm 91, we find solace and strength, knowing that those who dwell in your shelter will find rest and security. Lord, grant us the wisdom to dwell in your secret place, to abide in your presence each day of our lives. Help us to turn our hearts towards you, seeking comfort and guidance in times of trouble and uncertainty. Just as a bird finds safety in its nest, may we find our refuge in you, knowing that you are our fortress and our rock. In the face of adversity and challenges that may surround us, let us not be consumed by fear or anxiety. Instead, instill within us a spirit of courage and trust, knowing that you are with us wherever we go. Like a shield, your faithfulness surrounds us, guarding us from harm and leading us along paths of righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, protect us from the snares of the enemy and the dangers that lurk in the darkness. Shield us from illness, calamity, and harm, and grant us your divine favor and protection. Just as you delivered your people from the grasp of the enemy in times of old, deliver us from every evil and grant us victory over every adversary. May your angels watch over us, keeping us safe in all our ways, that not even a stone will trip our feet. Help us to walk in confidence, knowing that you have given us authority over all the powers of darkness. Strengthen our faith and empower us to stand firm in the face of adversity, knowing that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Lord, we thank you for your promises of provision and abundance. Just as you provided manna in the wilderness and quenched the thirst of your people, Provide for our every need according to your riches in glory. Help us to trust in your provision and to be faithful stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. Grant us your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Help us to dwell in unity and harmony with one another, bearing each other's burdens and lifting each other up in love. May your light shine through us, illuminating the darkness and bringing hope to those in despair. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.